Hi, welcome to NASA Launchpad. I'm your host, Justin Tully. So when I say Kepler, what flashes in your mind? Johannes Kepler, right? German mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, and key figure in the 17th century scientific revolution. His laws of planetary motion led Newton to his law of gravitation. But you knew all that, right? But there's a new Kepler in town. Actually, it's named after the old Kepler, and actually it's not in town anymore since it was launched into space on March 6, 2009. Anyway, it's NASA's new Kepler spacecraft, and it's NASA's first mission capable of finding Earth's size and smaller planets around other stars. The Kepler mission will be looking continuously at over 100,000 stars in one region of the sky, in the Cygnus and Lyra constellations. The field of view is extremely large for an astronomical telescope. Most telescopes, such as Hubble Space Telescope, only view a small region at one time. It's about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. Kepler covers a much larger field, about a hand at arm's length. The field of view is overhead at midnight in the middle of summer for those in the mid-northern latitudes and earlier in the evening in late summer and fall. Kepler uses the transit method to detect the existence of a planet. A transit occurs when a planet passes in front of its parent star and blocks a bit of starlight while doing so. Within our own solar system, we can observe planetary transits of Mercury and Venus from Earth when they pass in front of the Sun. The phenomenon is much like an eclipse. Although the planets are larger than our moon, they are also much farther away. So the transit just looks like a small black disk moving over the face of the Sun. Kepler will observe the same phenomena in order to detect Earth-sized planets, but from very far away. In fact, the distant suns that Kepler will observe are so far away that the stars are just points of light. Detecting an Earth-sized planet transiting a distant star is like observing a gnat flying in front of a car's headlight seen from many miles away. The problem is that the orientations of planet orbits in other solar systems are randomly aligned. Some may even orbit face on. Only about 1% of the planets are aligned so that they can be detected by the transit method. Hence, to detect a large number of planets, we can't just look at a few stars. Hundreds or even thousands of stars are not enough. With Kepler, the scientists will be observing over 100,000 stars at once to find Earth-sized planets. Kepler does not directly observe the image of a planet. Rather, it observes the effect the planet has on its parent star. If the orbit of the planet is aligned along Kepler's line of sight to the star, it will block a very tiny amount of light coming from the star to the Kepler telescope. The telescope will image the light from many stars at once. It uses 42 CCDs, charge-coupled devices, detectors similar to those in commercial digital cameras, but these are much larger, having a total of 95 megapixels. With the CCDs, Kepler is capable of observing over 100,000 stars all at once and measuring their brightness to an accuracy of better than one part in 100,000, or 10 parts per million. This is equivalent to watching a football game from the camera blimp and detecting every time just one person walks in or out of the stadium. The results from Kepler will come from measuring the brightness of the stars. The data will look like an EKG showing the heartbeat. Whenever a planet passes in front of its parent star, as viewed from our solar system, it produces a tiny pulse or beat. From the repeated beats, we can detect and confirm the existence of Earth-sized planets and learn about the orbit and size of the planet. A habitable planet, one that can have liquid water on its surface, must be between about 80% and 200% the diameter of Earth. Planets that are smaller than 8 tenths of an Earth diameter have less than half an Earth mass and do not have enough gravity to hold on to a life-sustaining atmosphere. Planets that are more than twice the diameter of Earth have about 10 Earth masses and enough gravity to hold on to hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe. Such large planets turn into gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. The habitable zone is the distance from a star where one can have liquid water on the surface of a planet. If a planet is too close to its parent star, it'll be too hot and water would have evaporated. If a planet is too far from a star, it's too cold and the water's frozen. Stars come in a wide variety of sizes, masses, and temperatures. Stars that are smaller, cooler, and lower mass than the Sun have their habitable zone much closer to the star than the Sun. Stars that are larger, hotter, and more massive than the Sun have their habitable zone much farther out from the star. So keep your ears and eyes open for news about Kepler. Who knows, a few years down the road when all those light curves are processed, maybe we'll have found a few planets that are similar to Earth. How exciting would that be, huh? Well, that's it for now. For NASA Launchpad, I'm Justin Tully. We'll catch you next time.